Hello, welcome to Red Read. Today I am exceptionally excited to be talking about William Gaddis's The Recognitions, a new favourite book of mine that I've been kind of teasing in the last couple of videos um, because it is a long book and I have been uh, spending quite a bit of time on it, but I have just finished it off and even before starting to read it, I knew that William Gaddis was going to be one of my, you know, favourite authors, just from the things that I've heard about him, the people that I know uh, were influenced by him, and the topics that he explored in his books. Um, and I was kind of content to just let the book sort of sit there and, and be that, exude that energy for a while, which I've done with some other books, uh, like Ulysses before, and I know that, uh, you know, I've got Robert Musil's A Man Without Qualities I recently got, and I know that's going to sort of just sit on my bookshelf for a little while. But, uh, uh, yeah, I finally decided, you know, it was, felt like the right time. I decided to commit uh, this month to reading uh, The Recognitions, the first book, and it was everything I wanted and more. I uh, honestly, I could talk for so long about this book and I've already tried to record a couple of videos that have ended up just as like long rambles. So I've got a list, uh, I've got a script kind of, um, and uh, what I'm going to do in order to cut down some of the videos, I'm just going to first start by acknowledging that there are a lot of uh, already uh, a lot of resources out there available, and so of course there's plenty of great reviews. There's uh, Chris Via Leaf by Leaf's review, his hour-long review on it, uh, but the, but really most importantly there is the uh, incredibly generous uh, the Recognitions Annotations website by uh, uh, Stephen Moore or Thomas Moore and. Uh, yeah, those that, that is uh, incredible. I'm going to attempt to cut down this video by um, not doing a plot summary, and instead what I've done is I've gone through my list of uh, annotations, which are admittedly in the hundreds, and I've just selected a couple of dozen that I'm going to uh, talk about that I'm going to jump to and read. I'll read an extract from the book, uh, but the ext extracts that I chose, I chose them because I'm usually able to sort of springboard off them and start to talk about uh, a extra, um, an extra concept or idea. But I'm going to go, uh, I'm gonna just uh, go over some of the areas that I want to talk about. I won't do a plot summary, but I will just right now introduce probably our four core main characters We've got Wyatt, uh, Wyatt Guion, who's the son of Reverend Guion, who is uh, our pretty much main character, uh, I guess. He is an art forger uh, who has gone through a sort of traumatic past. You know, his mother passed away because of uh, a man named Frank Sinistero who was posing as a doctor uh, and uh, performed like bad surgery on, on her uh, while uh, the, the father and the mother were overseas. Um, he ended up... Uh, Wyatt, uh, Wyatt Guion was then kind of under the care of his father uh, and also aunt his aunt May, who was a very devout, uh, very devoutly religious. And even though he started to present an aptitude for wanting to paint early on, she very quickly discouraged uh, making anything original uh, because only God is the is the original. Uh, God, uh, God can be the only original. And so what happens is that he ends up uh, growing up, continuing to develop his craft. He studies in Germany and spends some time in Paris. But really, for the bulk of the book, he ends up in New York, working under a uh, Mephistopheles uh, character, Rectal Brown, who says, hey, you're really, really good at making art. If you want to make a shit ton of money, how about you... Uh, how about I miraculously find these uh, missing paintings from these 15th century Flemish uh, artists uh, and we sell them for a lot of money, but actually you just painted them um, because he's exceptionally talented, but he can only make forgeries. He can't be an original. And so that's our main character, Wyatt. In and around Wyatt is where everything result, uh, revolves uh, and all of the other characters. So pretty much every character has some some first or, or at the very worst secondhand uh, interaction with Wyatt. And our other main characters are Otto, who is a almost, he's sort of unintentionally uh, a, a, a fake. Uh, he is trying to be a playwright and he's written, he He's written this play, The Vanity of Time, that he really believes he's worked very hard at and, and tried to put in a lot of effort to make it good, but the people who read his work just have this lingering sensation that things have been plagiarized. And so, for example, there are times where he will, um, uh, somebody will say, 
hey, uh, you know, this line was actually from uh, this, this famous uh, philosopher or something from, from many, many hundred years ago. And Otto is just like, uh, I didn't know that. I just heard a friend of mine say that. And, uh, or for example, he, will, someone will say, yeah, this whole section sounds a lot like, uh, The Sound and the Fury by Faulkner. And Otto was like, I've just never read that book. Uh, and I will, uh, I'll pivot in, back into that uh, shortly. Um, but that's Otto. And then we also have Stanley, who is a very, very devoutly religious, uh, religious Catholic. And he is trying to write this symphony, this Requiem Mass, more or less, uh, and, trying to get over the fact that he is a product of his times and he can't have this like great connection this unbroken connection to um to god uh, and to just create works that are pure extra expressions of his faith uh because that's how he sees the works of like bach and palestrina and all of the the old great classical masters uh, and then we have esme who is a sort of she's introduced as a sort of crazy uh like well not crazy but like i mean i guess they think she's crazy uh, like a uh, schizophrenic she's a heroin a heroin addict but she is really um just penetrates everybody except wyatt um uh, firstly she's like she becomes a surrogate mother figure for wyatt who uh, because of losing his mother at a young age and has this like really uh, basically uh, unresolved uh uh, mother complex and Esme starts to sort of sort of fulfill that for him she's a model for a lot of his paintings um, but she is an immensely interesting character as well partly in in that she just cuts to the core of all of the bullshit of every other character uh, and this might pop up in some of the extracts that I read later on but um, constantly men are try like Otto and Stanley are trying to conquer her and and she's just like Part of, part of her has to sort of succumb to it just because of, the, like, the nature of uh, her circumstance, but she's, she's always critical and she's just like, all you ever want to do is to take and you don't want to, you never think about putting something in, uh, and yeah, yeah, just this whole, it's, it's really hard to, to summarize Esme, um, you just need to sort of think of the whole conglomerate of her. But anyway, I'll take a list, uh, look at some of the list of things that I want to do. Again, I'm not going to talk about plot. Uh, I'm not going to go through the plot because that will sort of emerge as I start to tick off some of the, um, as I start to tick off some of the annotations. But a big thing that will stand out is if we're taking a look at the book, it is a big book. I know it is a big uh, uh, chonker and it is... Uh, it was a progenitor for um, uh, things like Gravity's Rainbow to start to exist. Uh, things, um, people, authors like Don DeLillo, who wrote Underworld, uh, which I own but probably won't read for a few years, um, uh, uh, and also Infinite Jest, David Foster Wallace was influenced by this. And this is a really interesting book because it sort of bridges the gap for me uh, between the maximalism, uh, the modernism of Ulysses and and the other stuff by, by sort of Faulkner and Wolf and into the postmodern era because this is, you know, really, I, I've always described uh, the sort of books that I like as being those that are somehow like great blends of modernism and postmodernism, which is why I sort of really gravitate towards people like uh, Nabokov, especially Nabokov's English novels and uh, Pinchon and now Gaddis, really. Um, and this is... Uh, a lot of the time you'll be like, wow, this is so cutting edge, uh, even though it was written in 1955. And so some of the postmodern techniques, uh, of course, there he will write in dialect uh, and he has this extreme extreme virtuosity probably not the like level of virtuosity as you get from some sections of ulysses but you know really like no one's conquered english like joyce uh, as 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 far as i've i've seen and I'm, I'm willing to be proven wrong but you know um you get this great uh, like i said this he has a definitely formidable virtuosity uh when it comes to writing in these different styles he does uh, occasionally write uh, from the perspective of a man named fuller who is a black man and he and it's very it's it's all right it's not like it's not as sort of you know in your face as when as when wallace did it in infinite jest uh, but uh, and i don't think he ever uses it as a means to i don't think gaddis ever uses this as a means to to demean uh, fuller but it, it will stand out as it is one of those scenarios of like a white man sort of writing in a dialect of 
uh, of a black man who is not as who is not as verbose, and it is part of his character to not be. But it is a bit of a funky scenario. At, at the very least, Fuller is an interesting character, and he uh, he's the sort of um, he works as a. I'm trying to think of what he is. Almost like, kind of like uh, you know. Uh, just a house a house servant for Rectal Brown, who is the man who is selling uh, Wyatt's uh, um, uh, Wyatt's forged paintings. Anyway, yeah, you will get a lot of, uh, but you'll get um, uh, a lot of different dialects of America, and then a lot of different mannerisms from people who are living in Spain and living in Italy. Uh, self-referentialism. So there is a part that will come up when I talk, uh, when I'm skimming through and I'm talking about critics where, you know, even people like uh, Mr. Gaddis himself will show up in the novel, but it's, it's very, very, um, it, it's very non-explicit. It's, it's not like, um, it's not like some other uh, authors like literally putting themselves in, but uh, self-referentialism, I've sort of combined that with awareness of literature and it's place in the literature. So like I already mentioned, you will get a lot of references to Faulkner. Uh, Rilke plays a really big part in this as, a, a, you know, um, for reasons that I'll, I'll get to. Uh, you'll get references to Dostoevsky, you'll get references to Tolstoy, and, and then again, even more contemporary people. But uh, another thing that I wrote was um, I had this sort of there was this really funny uh, feeling lingering that I, feeling that I had for the whole book, and really it was only after doing research after the book that I was able to dispel it. But I had this extremely strong uh, sensation that there was some Harold Bloom anxiety of influence going on because I'm like, how has Ulysses not been mentioned at all for a book like this? You know, uh, considering how much influence there was, and I thought that it was. It didn't seem like Gaddis was somebody to sort of shy away from talking about the influences of the book, but I was like, no one's mentioned Joyce or Ulysses uh, at all. You know, what is going on here? Or Finnegan's Wake. And um, uh, I learned later it was that it was one of those scenarios of uh, Gaddis hadn't even read Ulysses, which is something that I find really crazy. Like, uh, it's got a similar thing of... Uh, again, I've not read You Bright and Risen Angels. I do own it. Um, but it is a similar thing, I guess, to uh, William T. Volman talking about how he hadn't even read Gravity's Rainbow when he re uh, when he wrote that book. But it was... Um, uh, but people see the, see the similarities. So, yeah, that was something that was uh, really interesting. And I just had this whole... I had this, like, kind of slight, like... I feel like he should have talked about Ulysses. Like... Uh, oh, another contemporary, even Proust is being talked about. There's this great moment where uh, you overhear somebody walking and it's just like, reading Proust, is, you don't read it for the book, you read it for the experience. Uh, and that's how often, uh, it's great to hear how often um, uh, that is still said today, talking about uh, things like Gravity's Rainbow and so on. But yeah, yeah, that was a, that was... Um, uh, a funny thing, a funny feeling that I had, how similar it was, uh, it felt to me to Ulysses, but subsequently, uh, and doing research, I, I know I need to go and, and suss out some T.S. Eliot, because the, 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 um, the quartets and the wasteland, I've not read, I've not read that, uh, any of that, apparently it was a big, a big influence for the recognitions. Anyway, uh, moving on to alterations in the text, you do see some uh, kind of like displacement and whatnot. There is a lot of different, he explores a lot of different styles. There are things written in letters. Uh, of course, the text is written in the Joyce style. Another thing that was just so obvious, obvious Joyce influence is that all text is written with uh, M dashes and quotation marks are used only for actual quotes. Uh, but. Uh, and that really, really contributes to this sense of, uh, like, this effort that you need to put in because uh, in some parts, like in the parties, in the party scenes, it, it creates this excellent entropy, which I'll get back to that. Uh, but uh, you also really need to be paying attention to see who's talking. And uh, to his credit, Gaddis is usually exceptional with creating unique voices uh, so that you always know who's talking or, or you... Uh, for the parts where it matters, you really, really know who's talking and you're able to keep track of it. So some more things just to touch on before I start going into to my notes. Uh, the, I've already talked about the online resources and uh, on translating the text. So uh, similar to some other works, you will get a lot of foreign language text in this and it's 
really interesting because you sort of got to decide uh, how much effort you're going to put in, you know. Um, you will get Latin, Italian, Spanish, French, um, uh, Hungarian in parts. And, you know, for me, it's very much like I would just get out my, uh, you know, my Google Translate and just start translating uh, works, uh, translating sections and just putting in little uh, post-it notes and tags. But you do need to decide how much work you're going to put in. And it's uh, uh, the use of foreign language text also has this incredible point at the very, very end of the book um, that obviously I'll, I'll get to when I, I'll, I'll get to when I get to. But yeah, uh, what I would recommend is that uh, I guess just decide yourself how, how much you want to put in because uh, there are times where you will get entire blocks of texts that are just in French and I you know you need to translate the entire thing um, and uh, but the reason I'm mentioning it is because I was thinking about uh, reading this book at the time that it came out and obviously you, you uh, Gattis's readers could not be expected to have all of those languages just uh, at their command um, and they would need to really like go and consult extra extra texts and do some really hard work to translate this uh, and so yeah we can sort of take advantage of that luxury most of the foreign language stuff is translated in the William Gaddis uh, the recognitions annotations website some other parallels that have popped up, uh, I've already mentioned the sort of party scenes where Gaddis is talking about different characters uh, or using a lot of different characters and strings of text. And I found that there was a really um, uh, kind of, there was a lot of influence that I felt with Thomas Pinchon, especially his short story Entropy from Slow Learners. And also the scene in Infinite Jest, spoiler alert, big spoiler alert for Infinite Jest, skip like 10, 15 seconds, uh, the scene in Infinite Jest where Madame, Psy Madame Psychosis first attempts, uh, well, attempts to kill herself, uh, that whole kind of swirling party scene was, was very reminiscent to some of the stuff that we get in this book. Anyway, I think that's all of the preamble. I'm just going to jump in. I've got a list of maybe like two or three dozen extracts that I want to read and how it'll be framed is I'm just going to read the extract and then talk about it afterwards. Okay, starting from the very beginning, chapter one, the first turn of the screw, and I'm just going to mention the epigraph, which is Mephistopheles, was gibt es denn? And Wagner says, es wird ein Mensch gemacht, which means uh, Mephistopheles is saying, well, what is that? And Wagner says, it is a man being made. And uh, yeah, that is just this whole story. And again, leads into a sort of self-referentialism. There's like Faust is just all, all throughout this, the whole Faust story. And Gaddis talked about becoming very, very interested in that uh, uh, story or, or that idea in his 20s. This first chapter will probably be one of the most uh, like startling experiences for readers because you will just be shocked at the prose. So, and I'm just going to read because it is, it is incredible. I, I just have to read this section. Below, like a constellation whose configured stars only hazard to describe the figure imposed upon them by the tyranny of ancient imagination, where Argo in the southern sky is seen only with an inner eye of memory not one's own, so the ship against the horizonless sea of night left the lines which articulated its perfection to that same eye, where the most decayed and misused hulk assumed clean lines of grace beyond the disposition of its lights. And Gaddis is so musical, his, his writing is so poetic. It's uh, and like the first chapter is very very exceptional. Like it's just that on and on and on and on and on. And as it goes on, uh, uh, Gaddis will have like a sort of humor that will develop. Um, it's not all like uh, kind of lush stylist uh, style, but this first chapter will I think will I think be a be a startlement. And uh, one more that sort of just introduces a lot of the skepticism of religion that the the father, the Reverend Guion, and uh, that the father, Reverend Guion, will uh, assume and then will pass down to his son. Uh, and this is Guion talking, uh, talking about Guion, uh, the father, the Reverend Guion. 
So he lay alone one evening, perspiring in spite of the cold, almost asleep, to be wakened suddenly by the hand of his wife on his shoulder as she used to wake him. Uh, he struggled up from the alcove bed across the room to the window where the cold light slightly echoed passage. There was the moon reaching a still arm behind him to the bed where he had lain. He stood there unsteady in the cold, mumbling syllables which almost resolved into her name as though he could recall and summon back a time before death entered the world, before accident, before magic, and before magic despaired to become religion. And that, the reason I've highlighted that, despite it being, you know, a kind of touching moment of the Reverend uh, feeling his, uh, uh, having a sort of a vision of his wife coming back to him and then an immediate translation to the moon. Uh, and uh, Chris Veer in, in, in his video talks a lot about this, about the father and, and the mother being the sun and the moon, which is why the father, Reverend Guayon, eventually gets uh, arrested for preaching pagan Mithraism, which is this worship of the sun. And I, I just kept thinking of that George Carlin bit. <laughs> I would worship the sun. Gaddis will occasionally have these um, uh, sort of pithy statements. So, for example, Janet, a woman who lives at the house with the Reverend Guayon, Aunt May, and, and Wyatt. Uh, uh, Janet was willing. She was indeed far on the way to that simple-mindedness which many despairingly intelligent people believe requisite for entering the kingdom of heaven. And yeah, I just highlighted that because it's um, ju uh, just creating this sort of... Uh, it creates this distance between the people who are, who are severely intellectualized uh, and they... Um, it, that sort of sentimentality will come into play later when I talk about Mr. Pivner and Stanley. And early on um, in the book, Wyatt is afflicted with this uh, this condition that for some reason, that the doctors just can't seem to, to fix. And uh, the skepticism of science and the, want, the desire to transcend science uh, will come into play. And this is a really early sort of uh, setup for that. Uh, where... Uh, Reverend Guion is not only is he kind of angry at the at the doctors for not being able to do anything he's also just so uh, kind of displeased and um, uh, uh, responding negatively to all of the people's sort of just uh, willingness to say oh well science can't fix it so we can't do anything about it on the other, the spiritual hand, the congregation breathed out stale prayers for the boy's recovery, but in the end they always gave their God full leave to do as he wished, to remove the lad if such were his sacred whim, loading the fever-stricken boy with the guilt it had taken them generations to accumulate. This they called humility. I highlighted this because I wanted to talk about... Uh, uh I want to talk about Zadie Smith, actually. Uh, he did not spend time at cafe tables talking about form or line, colour, composition, trends, materials. He worked on his painting, or he did not think about it. And uh, while I don't, I don't uh, think that that's something particular to Zadie Smith, the reason I've mentioned her is just because I really like that she has been a similar voice of just talking about um, when people ask, you know, uh, where, how do you, what, what do you need to do to write? And she just says, all I need is time. Uh, she says, uh, when, you know, when you have kids, you, you can't, you can't be one of these people who's just sitting around waiting for inspiration. I need the perfect conditions. Uh, if I have time to write, I will write. And, and, so, and, uh, that echoes, I think, where a lot of people like Stanley and Otto will will have all of these conditions for, for needing to write and all of these things, but Wyatt represents this perfect archetype of just like, I am doing this uh, and otherwise I'm just resting. Okay, okay, and this uh, at this part of the novel, Wyatt has gotten married to Esther at her kind of uh, uh, provocation. Um, and he is sort of reflecting on himself. He's not doing anything with art. He's just been drawing like uh, uh, design schemata for bridges. And this is something that will kind of pierce to the heart of every artist who is who is not who, who feels like they're not fulfilling fulfilling their potential. Oh, so uh, just to give some context, um, this is Esther talking to friends about Wyatt. In and out dodged the vagrant spectre, careering uh, through conversations witness to that disinterested kindness which other people extend to one who does not threaten them with competition on any level they know. Cons 
Costumed in the regalia of their wary imaginations, he appeared and vanished in a series of images which, compacted, might have formed a remarkable fellow indeed, but in that diaspora of words which is the providential nature of conversation, the fugitive persisted, like those Jewish Christians who endured among the heathen, here in the figure of a man who, it appeared at last, had done many things to envy and nothing to admire. Which, man, I've never read an... Well, the only other sections that I've read from a book that were just like piercing right into the person was probably uh, David Foster Wallace talking about plateaus in Infinite Jest. And then here, here's some uh, oft quoted sections from the work. Uh, uh, Esther Wyatt's wife is, is uh, expressing her uh, uh, sadness at the fact that she found out that Rilke was gay and... Uh, she was saying that she wanted to meet him and why it's just like why you know and he says what did you want of him that you didn't get from his work and then the big thing something that Gaddis himself felt and uh, was channeled into Wyatt this passion for wanting to meet the latest poet shake hands with the latest novelist get hold of the latest painter devour what is it what is it they want uh, from a man that they didn't get from his work. What do you expect? What is there left of him when he's done the when he's done his work? What's any artist but the dregs of his work? The human shambles that follows it around. What's left of the man when the work's done but a shambles of apology? And so here we're getting into some uh, self-referentialism again. Uh, Gaddis very much knows that this is a book that is going to be hard to read, and he's crit he's sort of channeling his uh, he's venting his rage through Esther, through Wyatt, talking to Esther about, um, about kind of contemporary novels. And so here we go. It never takes your breath away, telling you things you already know, laying everything out flat, as though the terms and the time and the nature and the movement of everything were secrets of the same magnitude. They write for people who read with the surface of their minds, people with reading habits that make the smallest demands on them, people brought up reading for facts, who know their who know what's going to come next and want to know what's coming next uh, and get angry at surprises. Clarity is essential and detail. No fake mysticism. The facts are bad enough. But we're embarrassed for people who tell too much and tell it without surprise. How does he, how does he know what happened unless it's one unshaven man alone in a boat changing I to he? Hemingway reference, I believe. Uh, and how often do you get a man alone in a boat in all this... All this... Listen, there's so many delicate fixtures moving toward you, you'll see. Like a man going into a dark room, holding his hands down, guarding his parts for fear of a table corner, and why all around us is... Why all this around us is for people who can keep their balance only in the light, where they move as though nothing were fragile, nothing tempered by possibility, and all of a sudden, bang, something breaks. Then you have to stop and put the pieces together again. You can never put them back together quite the same way. You stop when you can expose things and leave them within reach and others come on by themselves and they break and even then you may put the pieces aside just out of reach until you can bring them back and show them put together slightly different maybe a little more enduring but until you've broken it and picked up the pieces uh, and picked up the pieces enough times and you have the whole thing in all its dimensions but the discipline the detail it's just sometimes the accumulation is too much to bear here we get an introduction to Otto, who I've already mentioned is the uh, the playwright, and he has what Otto has done is he has created this perfect character uh, in uh, the Vanity of Time, his play. The main character Gordon is uh, well, I can describe it actually, but the reason I like it and a preface to it is that Otto is actually a self-deprecating author insert, which I really really like. So. They're just having a conversation, and then somebody says, uh, somebody says something along the lines of, uh, "You don't need to make things explicit, which which should be uh, implicit." And so Otto writes, Gordon says, "Don't make things explicit, which should be implicit, i.e., friendship." And he's talking about his play. He says, "I haven't finished it yet. The plot still needs a little tightening up." By the and then in brackets, uh, Gaddis writes. By this, Otto meant that a plot of some sort had yet to be supplied to motivate the series of monologues in which Gordon, a figure who resembled Otto at his best moments and whom Otto greatly admired, said things which Otto had overheard or thought of to say 
or, or thought of too late to say. So leading back into uh, talking about Esme and the relationship, the way that she's able to sort of break the veil of all of the all of the bullshit from the men in her life, the suitors. Otto felt strange holding her thin wrist that Esme could give all and lose nothing, for the taker would find she had given nothing, plundering her, the plunderer would turn to find himself empty, and she still silently offering. You know, I, uh, you will find some really, really great similes uh, in this work, but it's, um, uh, it's not quite the sort of like, whoa, similes that you get from, from David Foster Wallace, but here's a really nice one. Otto and Esme sat quiet for a few minutes, for, es for Esme a content quiet demanding nothing, for him a perilous one, the minutes building up upon themselves like a precarious house of cards waiting to be shattered. Okay, and now the, the pained thing, so this, uh, this leads into, uh, I kind of skipped over it, but it's so good that I, I almost wanted to save it. One of the really kind of almost messed up images that uh, the Reverend Guion starts to pass on to Wyatt when he's young is he's starting to introduce these like pagan ide ideas but of course but uh, another really really impactful image on on Wyatt and what leads to so much self-deprecation is this idea of them of the pathway to heaven being made intentionally dirty uh, in order to kind of, uh, and uh, conversely, the the walkway to hell being pristine and clear in order to sort of uh, discourage, or in order to encourage sinners to go down. Uh, and that idea of like the pathway to heaven being kind of filled with like muck and disgust uh, is, I, I think that is such a strong image that embedded into Wyatt's mind with what led to this sort of self-deprecating and destroying himself in order to create this perfect art, which uh, comes into play when he is making these forgeries because they can't be perfect. They're, they're supposedly 400 years old and he's talking about how once it's done being painted, it's not quite finished. And he's talking with Rectal Brown. Is it nearly done? Brown demanded, standing over them. Yes, it is. It's more than finished, really, he said, looking up at, at Brown. More than finished? Yes, I... You know, it's finished. It has to be damaged now. That must be difficult, Basil Valentine said. It is. It's the most difficult part. Not the actual damaging it, but damaging it without trying to preserve the, past, the parts that cost such. Well, you know, that's where they fail. A good many painters who do this kind of work they can't resist saving those parts and anyone can tell anyone can tell and so another part uh, kind of dovetailing off that because it's just like one or two pages later uh, valentine talking to uh talking to wyatt and saying true to your art so to say and then wyatt uh pithily says true yes that's like saying a man's true to his cancer Okay, continuing onward and upward, we've been introduced to Mr. Pivna, Otto's father, and I just have to read this whole section because it is great. Uh, Gaddis goes on this long, long, long rant. Uh, he is not a fan of uh, the self-help books, the Dale, the Dale Carnegie as uh, style, and uh, yeah, well, just enjoy this. Behind was a veneered secretary of anonymous cent of anonymous century. Uh, and unavowed design, holding protected glass behind an assortment of books published by the hundred thousands, treatises, treatises on the cultivation of the individual self, prescriptions of superficial alterations in vulgarity, read with excruciating eagerness by men alone in big chairs, the three-way lamp turned to its wildest brilliance as they fingered those desperate blazons of individuality tied in mean knots around their throats, fastened monogrammed uh, tie clasps, the more firmly swung keys on gold-plated monograms bearing individualized keychains uh, tight tightened their arms against wallets in inside pockets which held the papers proving their identity beyond doubt to others in moments of doubt to themselves papers in such a variety that the bearer himself became their appurtenance each one co contemplating over words in a book 
which had sold 4 million copies, How to Speak Effectively, Conquer Fear, Increase Your Income, Develop Self-Confidence, Sell Yourself and Your Ideas, Improve Your Memory, Increase Your Ability to Handle People, Win More Friends, uh, Improve Your Personality, Prepare for Leadership, The Self Which Had Ceased to Exist the Day They Stopped Seeking It Alone. Ooh, ooh, man, talk about a fucking mic drop. Again, in this same section from Mr. Pivner, I got us talking about a world, uh, the sort of disconnection from things in a, uh, I guess, in a capitalist world uh, of, of mass production, which is making me super excited to go and read JR at some point. The streets were filled with people whose work was not their own. They poured out like buttons from a host of common ladles, though some were of pressed paper, some ivory, some horn and synthetic pearl to be put in place to break or fall off lost, rolling into gutters and dark corners where no omnipotent hand could reach them, no omniscient eye could see them, to be replaced, seaming up the habits of this monster they clothed their lives, they clothed with their lives. And another, uh, so sort of in contrast to that, uh, in this part of the story, Wyatt's kind of gone crazy and he's going home to see his father back out in the country and another nice simile uh, or imagery that they, that Gaddis employs, uh, the townspeople are talking, criticizing the city, the city folk. They live in cities where nothing grows. Did you know that? Nothing grows in the city. Even their minds, they keep steam heated. Their horizons are dirty windowsills. And there's another line, I don't think I highlighted it or, or outlined it, but um, there's another scene where they walk into a party and Gaddis writes, they entered a room of people who spend their lives in rooms. Okay, here's an interesting quote that is often used in the book and I think people uh, uh, mostly use it when talking about art, but Esme is, uh, she's in this, it's alteration. Otto is like trying to propose to her basically and she's just being like, nah, dude, you know, you're, you." Nah. Uh, and she says, uh, he's talking about what is beauty uh, and he's just trying to say that she's beautiful. And uh, she says, if it is not beautiful for someone, it does not exist. And I think it's interesting that that's actually used not in art. Uh, I mean, it's the, the parallels are obvious considering what why it's going through. But uh, I really like that for actually for a person um, who's uh, purportedly so so beautiful. And then later on, she just like zings him with this uh, line. You are the only one you make unhappy when you behave badly, Otto. You become the victim of your own observations. Moving on, similar to this thing, uh, Otto and Stanley are talking. Stanley obviously is trying to live by this uh, strongly pious ideal. And Max says to another character, Max says to them, you want everyone to be like you. That's your trouble, Stanley. And Stanley says, I want everyone to be like I want to be. Which is still just the same thing. It's just you're kind of enforcing your idealism onto onto the world. Otto, Otto and Stanley are talking and Otto... Uh, so Max is a character who is sort of embracing this fact that, yes, you, you can plagiarize. You can you might not be entirely original, but just like just make things anyway. And there are times when he publishes a work, I believe, and uh, uh, it's unclear whether he realizes this or not, but it's, it's just Rilke's Duino elegy. Um, uh, but they had this whole conversation and, and uh, Otto ends up saying to Max... Uh, ends up saying to Stanley, I hate him when he's referring to Max and Stanley asks why and Otto says, because he will survive. Again, uh, Gatta's just going to town enjoying uh, just shit talking Mr. Pivner. Uh, Christ and Confucius appeared to recite the golden rule and bow out, leaving Mr. Pivner and four million other individuals with the clever secret of humility, which carefully used led the prey in the opposite direction toward in the opposite direction to self aggrandizement, the illusion of power. In fact, sometimes when he was tired, Mr. Pivner felt that the sublime secret was to behave like a doormat, to present himself to the world as a cheerful simpleton with no ideas of his own, a good-natured half-wit turning the other cheek to, to personify Nietzsche's idea of the Christian, a congenital idiot with nothing to gain. Ooh, another line. This is something that uh, Otto has sort of felt about himself, but it absolutely penetrates him when he hears somebody else say it. They sort of make it real, where Max, the man who has uh, been criticized before for, for plagiarizing says Otto's part of a series of an original that never existed. 
Yep, a great scathing criticism of critics. Again, Gaddis knows this book is going to be hard and it's going to be criticized. Uh, and then Benny, uh, Benny, another character. There's a lot of characters if it's, if it's not obvious. How long is it since you've seen the sunrise, he demanded. Then he went on, how you would have done it. That's the way it is. That's the way everything is, isn't it? How you would have done it. Not how it should have been done, but how you would have done it. When you criticize a book, that's the way you work, isn't it? How you would have done it because you didn't do it. Because you're still afraid to admit that you can't do it yourself. Stanley is fascinated with this idea of creating a work that is going to have to contain it all. That is going to be just uh, like the perfect transcendent divinity. Uh, but um, talking about this, uh, like talking about his in insecurities about this, this self-sufficiency of fragments, that's where the curse is. Fragments that don't belong to anything. Separately, they don't mean anything, but it's impossible to pull them together into a whole. And now it's impossible to accomplish a body of work without a co continuous sense of time. So instead you try to get all the parts together into one work that will stand by itself and serve the same, th the same thing a lifetime of separate works does. Something higher than itself. Man. Man. And you know, that's something I really like a lot is because that ties into something similar that the composer, a composer I'm very fond of, an improviser, Anthony Braxton, talks about, where he very much uh, stresses that, you know, in all things, but at least in the jazz community, you can't just find like an exemplary album. You can't understand Coltrane just by looking at Giant Steps or, or uh, you know, Miles just by Kind of Blue or whatever. You need to really do in put in the work and understand their entire discography and it's it's not just that uh, Coltrane nailed it with one thing and uh, all of the earlier stuff is him working up to that and all of the uh, later stuff is him reacting to that the entire the entire series is is important for understanding the character okay okay Basil Valentine and Wyatt are getting in this massive, massive argument because uh, Wyatt is similar to Stanley, kind of hating himself for having to make these works and not being able to just work closer to God. And Valentine just, whew, you and your work, your precious work, your precious Van der Goes, your precious Van Eyck, uh, your precious not Van Eyck, but what I want, and your pre precious Chancellor Roland. Look at him there, look at him. Yes, why didn't you paint him into a virgin and child and donor? Do you think it's any different now? That that fat-faced Chancellor Roland wasn't just like him? Yes, swear to me by all that's ugly, Valentine hissed and got breath. Vulgarity, cupidity and power. Uh, is, that what is that what frightens you? Is, is that all you see around you and you think it was different then? Flanders in the 15th in the 15th century, do you think it was all like the adoration of the mystic lamb? What about the paintings we've never seen, the trash that's disappeared? Just because we have a few masterpieces left, do you think they were all masterpieces? What about the pictures we've never seen and never will see, uh, that, uh, that were as bad as anything that's ever been done? And your precious Van Eyck, do you think he didn't live up to his neck in a loud vulgar court, in a world where everything was done for the same reasons everything's done now, for vanity and avarice and lust? and the boundless egoism of these Chancellor Rollins, uh, do you think they knew the difference between what was bizarre and what was beautiful? That their vulgar ostentation uh, didn't stifle beauty everywhere, everywhere? The way it is, t the way it's, d uh, the way it's doing today? Yes, damn it, listen to me now and swear by all that's ugly. Do you think any painter did anything but hire himself out? These fine altarpieces, do you think they glorified anyone but the vulgar men who commissioned them? Do you think a Van Eyck didn't curse having to whore away his genius to waste his talents on all, the so on all sorts of vulgar celebrations at the mercy of people he hated? Ooh. This is this is a passage. There's a, a scene in sort of part three where we jump to some people working at a news station, uh, and they're talking about uh, some ideas that are really, again, making me wanting to go and read J.R. No matter how much you talk to them, they don't get it. It's too simple. It's too goddamn simple for them to understand. They still think their cigarettes would cost them half as much without advertising. Their whole goddamn standard of American life depends on the American economy. The whole goddamn American economy depends on mass production. To sustain mass production, you gotta have a mass market. To sustain a goddamn mass market, you gotta have advertising. That's all there is to it. A product would drop out of sight overnight without advertising. I don't care what it is, a book or a brand of soap, it would drop out of sight. 
We've had the goddamn ages of faith. We've had the goddamn ages of reason. This is the age of publicity. Okay, in this final section, this is an introduction to the character Ludi, uh, who is a um, who is a novelist and who has an interaction with Wyatt in the very end when Wyatt is in the monastery painting. Uh, I think that Ludi is basically just kind of uh, presented or described in order to be just the the perfect perfect juxtaposition of a person who is financially successful but almost spiritually vapid. And so let me read. For he was not here to be converted, neither did he have any intention of trying to convert his fellow man or those earnest women at home. He was not a Roman Catholic or any other kind and had no idea of becoming one. He considered himself quite free and simply Christian. If pressed, he might have, he might have been called Protestant simply because he was not a Catholic. He limited himself to no special denomination, subscribed to no segregated cult, but held them all in equal esteem. As his writings showed, he found his duty to his fellow man in uh, proselytizing for those virtues which bound his fellow fellow man's better selves together, favoring none over another beyond among the systems of worship he saw all round, honoring all, advancing in the name of some amorphous and highly reasonable good in the true eclectic tradition of his country, a confederate of virtue wherever he found it, and a go-between for the postures uh, it assumed, explaining not man to himself, but men to each other. All of which meant that he reached his fellow man in large numbers as his serene face on the dust jacket and his loyalties sh and his royalties showed. And so Wyatt is, is trying to come to this sort of apotheosis uh, about uh, living past sin. At this point, he's uh, committed a murder. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, he says this. Look back, if once you've started in living, you're born into sin then. Uh, and how do you atone? By locking yourself up in remorse for what you have done or by living through it? By locking yourself up in remorse uh, with what you know you have done or, or by going back and living it through? By locking yourself up with your work until it becomes a gessoed surface, all prepared, uh, clean, and smooth as ivory, or by living it through, by drawing lines in your mind, or by living it through, uh, if it was sin from the start and possible at all time to kn to know it's possible and avoid it, or by or or by living it through. I used to wonder how Christ could really have been tempted if he was sinless and rejected the first and the second and the third temptation. How was he tempted? How did he know what it was the way we do to be tempted? No, he was Christ. But for us, with it there from the start and possible all the time to go on knowing it's possible and pretend to avoid it or, or to have lived it through and live it through and deliberately go on living it through. And then we get uh, the sort of uh, almost punchline, I guess, of, of Wyatt, where he says, you know, now at last to live deliberately, which is, uh, of course, not even an original kind of quote or saying it's a, it's a, a Henry David Thoreau thing, but it was, it's employed perfectly, especially in light of this man who, is, or, who has lived all his life as a thief, as he says. And then, so after that, after we have that, we have a kind of final chapter, which is just catching up on and finding all of the characters. And uh, I was, I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever uh, with this, uh, until we get to the very end. And leading back into this idea of um, how much effort you're going to put in with regards to the translation work, uh, I thought it was so, uh, such an excellent choice for Gaddis to put the final explanation with, with the priest telling Stanley in uh, Italian uh, to not play the organ with too much bass because the church can't handle it and then Stanley uh, can't understand him because he's not learned the language and uh, he goes through and he plays it and then the whole building collapses and then of course the final line he was the only per person caught in the collapse and afterwards most and afterward most of his work was recovered too and it is still spoken of when it is noted with high regard though seldom played i don't know what else i can say about this this is uh, i've already talked for talked for quite a while and i oh, man what a book 
Anyway, this is The Recognitions by William Gaddis. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I hope you uh, have read it and have also uh, also uh, kind of in on the greatness of this. I recommend you push through and really try to get to it because this is an immensely rewarding book. I cannot wait to reread it. Uh, I yeah, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.